Um, we are back with another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Uh, as a lot of you have kind of noticed the past couple episodes, it's kind of more from just a wing T podcast to kind of an all-offensive, defensive, mostly offense podcast. Um, uh, Coach Deary is back for this episode. Uh, Coach Deary, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good, Coach. Um, and then we have a special guest with us today. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name because I don't want to offend him or butcher it. Um, he's a, a very good friend of our channel. Um, all four or five or six or how many ever videos he has for my channel will be in the link in the bottom of the bio. Um, but uh, Coach Dom, how you doing? I'm great, Coach. How are you guys? I'm, I'm doing good. Do you want to actually pronounce your last name so somebody knows actually how to pronounce it? Um, it's Googliamo. Okay. So Googly is pretty phonetical, and then yeah. where it says Elmo is just Amo, A-M-O. Oh, that's how, that's how I spell it. I, it's usually Goog, Lie, Elmo is how I f- f- fanatically do it in my head. Um, I, I do have to give Coach a shout-out real quick uh, because I, I do uh, – actually, I give a couple people shout-outs. One, I always give Mike Deary a shout-out because he's the first video on the channel. Um, he's kind of one that helped start – this whole monster. Well, I'm um, sugar coder. I am the reason. Oh, let's not go that far. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm being an egomaniac. Yeah, don't, don't go that far. Make myself feel good. I'm trying to be nice here, and you're ruining it. Um, <laughs> and then, then obviously, I, I have a series of videos after that from people that are friends or that I've known over the years. And then, then two coaches I kind of credit with giving – not legitimacy is probably a bad word, but two college guys that kind of took a chance on somebody who had like three videos on YouTube at that point. Um, one was Runda at Bluffton, uh, who did his three safety video, and the other was you, who for some mad reason decided to give me like five videos at once because you got bored. Um, and that is a quote. That is a quote exactly, for, and I could probably pull up the message somewhere. I was like, so which one do you want to do? He's like, oh, I can do all of them. I'm bored. No, it's COVID season. <laughs> yeah. Probably right in the beginning of COVID, they sent us home, and you're like, you want to do videos? And I'm like, shoot. <laughs> Because I think you'd like followed me or I'd followed you like two weeks, two or three weeks before. I think because you were, I mean, because you, you, I mean, you guys are obviously in Ohio because you're in Pennsylvania right next to us. And so it kind of just, it kind of just all worked out. I'm like, oh, here's an O-line coach I can talk to. Um, but for people who don't know your background, because you've been at a couple of different places um, as a player, GA assistant, all that. Uh, do you want to kind of give a quick background real quick? Of course. Um <clears throat> Well, I'm a military kid, so I've lived all over the country. Um, eight states, nine different moves. Um, played college football at SUNY Brockport for um, Coach Rocco Salomon and um, eventually Coach Jason Mangoni. And then I got my first college coaching shot out in Duluth, Minnesota at College of St. Scholastica, where, believe it or not, I coached a little running backs and wide receivers, which is an interesting treat. Um, then I actually ended up in Ohio at Heidelberg University as a graduate assistant. And two years and eight months ago, um, the running joke is I tricked Coach Shiggins into hiring me here at uh, Keystone and Coach's Own Line. And it's been an awesome process. So here I'm the O line tight ends guy and the recruiting coordinator and work with the strength. So. Okay. I mean, I, I, I can make a joke about tight ends in your system and they're just block glorified linemen. Um, but but I'll be nice because I've had a couple of your staff. I mean, heck, I've, I, you, your Keystone and Utica. I've had probably about half the staff on both. Um, obviously, your head coach did something for our state clinic, um, which our virtual state clinic. Your offense coordinator has been on my channel. Um, your receivers coach had just did a podcast that'll be out way after this because that's the special teams podcast. That's a whole nother minefield of like 27 episodes that go through the end of may um because i grinded those out um so i appreciate you coming on today we're going to um for people who didn't look at the bio and just click on stuff um we're going to talk sport out protection um and part of the reason is well one i'm an offensive coordinator now so i'm very curious on anything offense um but two it i mean it is kind of like the general high school pass protection at this point like it, it's how high schools deal with uh, kids with bad arms and getting them out of the pocket or bad protection, getting them out of the pocket, or if you have that mobile quarterback, getting them out on the edge uh, to where he can run or throw. Um, so that's kind of what Coach – Coach, we're, we're going to do kind of like Q&A with Coach, and then he's going to show a couple clips at the end 
Um, he's going to try to talk through them, and we'll kind of uh, um, pretend to sound smart, uh, me and Coach Derry will, because um, Dom's the, the real guy. But uh, let's, let's first talk a, about uh, sprint out, Coach. Um, you, I mean, you guys do a little bit of sprint out there at Keystone. Um, kind of what what are kind of your like base rules, kind of your foundation, kind of how do you teach and teach uh, sprint out to your alignment? Well, sprint out is you got to understand what it is really for us. I mean, you got a it's getting the pocket move. Um, and like you said, you got to let the quarterback be athletic, and if your quarterback is arm deficient. Uh, allow him to get on the move and make a quick dump, whether you're running it to a smash or almost a mesh type concept. But really what it is for us is the defenses need to read something. They do. That's, that's their job. Um, it, for me, the need to read aspect is what the best part about it is. So where we do sprint out, we do outside zone steps with our front side tackle all the way to our backside guard, and then we gap seal our tackle, our backside tackle. So it looks just like an outside run play. So what that does is for programs that A, have a quarterback that, I'll go on the positive side here, excels in a sprint out way or um has an offensive line that is good at outside zone maybe or is not that great in pass pro it uses the defense's need to read against them because when you're doing outside zone steps are you really getting a pass rush yeah no they're reading they're reading where you're going they're spending more time look, figuring out what you're trying to do and why that guy is gap hinging or why the tailback is blocking back or lead blocking. And they're trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Use their need to read against them. And you're spreading the defensive backfield out. So the pocket's moving, the quarterback's moving. The front side might be contained routes like a smash concept, but the back side, they're dragging all the way across formation. So it's kind of throwing a lot of stuff into a blunder for the defense that they just can't keep up with mentally sometimes. That's why you see those mobile quarterbacks in the NFL, like the Patrick Mahomes and stuff, they'll keep him, I mean, other than Super Bowl naturally, but they'll keep <laughs> him moving mm-hmm. against these pass rushers they can't handle because once you start moving the pocket, most of those pass rush moves, the defensive lineman's anticipating maybe a one-arm step, maybe a which we call a drummer boy punch. Maybe they're waiting for you to retreat so they can cut underneath. It takes away all those keys away so they don't get a real pass rush. Yeah, they're trying to cross your face, and if you're trying to cross your face, they're not getting the quarterback. Yeah, well, it makes your guard grass all over the place. I mean, you got to cover so much more ground. And I think I think the one thing from a defense perspective that really messes with anyone, I mean, you could probably go up to the NFL, when you got a quarterback attacking the flank, moving, out of the pocket, it makes that decision, the defender make a decision. Either he's got to come up and tackle you, or he's going to give up a 15-yard, 20-yard pass. You know what I mean? It's it's something that I was excited to listen about the podcast, because I think it's one of the, like, what I like when you do, and you run an outside zone stuff with it. So, like, my, my answer is, okay, if there's a rollout, I'll just have my play side linebacker rush him. You know what I mean? They'll just be the force player. But, like, you can't necessarily do that if you're running other outside zone and stuff off of it. I mean, that changes everything. So I'm excited to kind of hear more of a, a nosedive into what you're doing there because that is pretty good. So hopefully I can help my offensive staff out with that. Yeah, and in the, if you think about it, if you the way we do it is we're taking those outside zone steps, it almost looks like a read option. It looks like outside zone. Yeah. yeah. If you go formation to boundary, it's something different than you go formation to the field. Mm-hmm. No doubt. FOB and you're running towards the boundary, they're like, that's not a lot of room, but then that smash looks really good because they're trying too hard <laughs> to cover too little ground. Mm-hmm. 
And for the offensive line, and you want to keep it as simple as possible, and every video I said, you just don't want the guys to think. I mean, they're, they're offensive line, and they're smart, but don't let them think too hard. They're just running outside zone. Okay. Now, even navigate to the second level, the ball's already gone. Now, does the technique for you change at all? I mean, obviously, the, the backside hinge, what I call hinge, is different. But for the other, is there any actual technique differences? than when you? Because I know you guys run zone schemes anyways. Is there any difference from your wide outside zone and your um, sprint out in terms of actual the actual footwork or the hand placement for the technique? No, because we're shuffling anyway. Okay. So we're doing that drive, catch, shuffle, keeping our shoulders just square to the line. And also what that does is it's harder to – It's the reason we transition from the outside zone where you're turning your shoulders, to taking the bucket step and then going and throwing your inside hand up to that shuffle – is because that shuffle is using so many different things that that's one more thing the defensive guys have to think. Because if you're uncovered, we're going to take that shuffle step in inside zone. Same shuffle step to look at that uncovered gap before we navigate to the linebacker. If they're seeing that in inside zone, now they're seeing that in outside zone. Well, I like it too because I I think uh, when I coach on the wing team, we were a big jet sweep team. Um, we kind of got away with the bucket step as well, because I think the, when we got away from that, it stopped penetration too. Uh, I think a lot of defenses are getting a lot. We're getting a lot better at stopping outside wide zone and even zone just by getting penetration. And you know, getting them, you might reach me, but I'm going to disrupt your play. But now when you shuffle, you kind of you got more weight going forward, and you're stopping penetration too. I, I don't. I forget who I saw. It was a state clinic who I saw. I was just like, that just makes too much sense. You know, it's kind of too old school to be doing a bucket step reach. And I mean, if you get the grade, if you don't, well, you just blew up the the defensive guy's going to blow up that play. Well, that's where as like offensive coaches, we got to start finding answers because you defensive coaches, because wide zones become the popular thing right now. It's like like three high and four eyes have become the popular thing on defense is the, the it thing. Wide zones become the it thing. Like, you can think Coach Caduti, Ohio State, um, and a couple, uh, I mean, wh- whoever else, else runs it. Like, uh, the, I'll, um, Kyle Shanahan at the 49ers. I mean, they, his family's been running it forever, but he's put it on max at the 49ers. Like, that's, I mean, y'all have to start finding answers for it again. So either as offensive coaches, we either got to go back to a different scheme once you've found answers to that, or we got to start changing technique or doing stuff like it mirrors your sprint out protection. Um that way, you you have there's some sort of hesitation or advantage we can get. Um, that, I mean, that that's kind of the I mean obvious answer to that. I mean that's just I mean anytime somebody finds an answer for something, you gotta have a rebuttal. Um, and if you don't, that's where you have some problems. I mean that's as me and my current head coach talk all the time. Um, start looking at scheme stuff. Okay, if they do this, what's our answer for this and this? What do we have that built into our system yet? Because if we don't, we need to figure that out. Um, do you? Does that include some sort of like count system for your offensive line too, or is it literally just like gap sound from out to in? I, that's the real difference between that and the outside zone. Okay. So in outside zone, we are we're a combo based team, so it'll either be uh, the solo, the tag, the sig. Uh, we use the same front side, back side. In a sprint out, we're less concerned with that because the only thing important is that gap in the pass game, really. I mean, we're not necessarily – we're looking for the linebackers. We can still make our zone calls because we want to focus on a certain linebacker, but we're not na- – our goal is not to navigate to the second level. Our goal is to secure the first level and after the catch then navigate to the second level or when we see that quarterback run past us then navigate to the second level so we're an inside zone the first level takes about 55 percent of our thought process because we want to get movement and um seal off defenders at the first level and pass pro we're 90 percent first level and then 10 percent second level but we want to look the same because now we are shuffling we can get down that line, and let's be quite frank, that offensive line is not going to move 15 yards to the right. Yeah. 
you're just trying to get four or five extra yards to increase that surface area for that um, quarterback to A, throw it, or B, run. Now, do you guys have a call for if when you guys are sprinting out and the quarterback sees grass to tell the lineman that they can just go at that point? Does the quarterback yell something? Is there some sort of acknowledgement there? Or is it just he's got – it's kind of more of a naked at that point. He's just running for his life. Um, our gen- So I think that comes a lot with repetition. I mean, there's no real call because the offensive line is communicating throughout the play. There's not like a go call. I mean, yes, they have their validity, but what are the chances everybody's going to hear it in the midst yeah. of the play? Well, it's That's- COVID, so maybe. There's nobody there. Yeah. <laughs> but – I like to equate it as me stop jumping up and down the sideline, screaming very nice things to my offensive lineman during the game. They don't hear me. They don't. I'm just doing it to make myself feel better. Yeah. They're not going to hear the quarterback. So what our general rule is that we expect that ball to be out in three seconds. Okay. And a sprint out quicker in a drop back. But understand that we're running three seconds. So if they're getting one, two, three, four shuffles in, that ball is either – Something's wrong. Yeah. He's running it, or it's already completed, we can go upfield. Okay. So in the sprint out, we're giving it the one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. Go, or if we see that ball cross our face, go. Okay. Because if he cuts back, and here's and here's a reason we can get away with that count-ish. If he rolls backwards or running around back there, it turns into a wrong play. Yeah. And if he's getting chased by somebody, it's our fault. Yeah. So then then we just fight to it and block somebody. Now, you know, we talked that front side technique. What is the backside hinge technique? What is the actual footwork on that? So understanding that that B gap is very exposed. We have to A, power down on the B gap. If someone's trying to cross our face to get to the B gap, we have to go with them. So we're still doing that, basically that shuffle technique yeah. with the rest of the offensive line. Trying to account for that end. So if he goes with us, that's our guy. B gap first. Because what's the quickest path to the quarterback? It's B gap. Yeah. And then. And if we don't, what we're doing is we're transferring our weight to our inside foot and opening up the door and basically creating a wall on the backside. So we're looking for any, if he's, if the pre-snap call of the stunt is outside, he's naturally not going to go with the tackle. He's going to go outside, so we're going to hinge back over. If he drops, if we're playing a team that drops their DM and then blitzes a linebacker, we'll see that. And when we turn back around, we're worried about that second-level guy um, basically coming hard in the C-gap. So it's B to C-gap defense. Okay. And it's the same person for techniques to backside of power and counter. All right. Okay, and then how much do you guys keep your tight end or H-back or whatever in on your protection? Obviously, your running back is probably usually your lead blocker. Um, but in terms of your H-back or tight end, how much do they stay in compared to how much they stay go out? So it really depends on the scheme, naturally, and who we're playing. So our general rule is if our tight end is play side and not going out for the pass – our lineback or running back will go and fill the backside yeah. somewhere because we're counting that Y as a lead blocker. It increases the surface. If he's going out, if the tight ends on the front side and going out for a route, then the tailback needs to lead block. Yeah. So it's basically whatever we're scheming that week. Like if we know our tight end can get open coming off the line, which happens quite often, um, even if it's a quick something like spot yeah. route. It's hard to say percentage-wise because the natural is all based on what we're seeing. Or if we know that if we start rolling our quarterback out or moving our pocket like that, we're even running outside zone and they're sending in a corner, no matter what, to stop the outside zone play, if they're sending a Sam, we're going to keep that Y in. And we're just going to use the uh, tailback to fill in the back and – Use him as a blocker. It's all based on the defensive tendency. And it's something that we can change mid-game just based on the call because we have pass combinations with the tight end involved and without the tight end. Yeah. And if we put the tight end on the backside, he becomes the gap sealer. 
and the tackle adds into the slot. So it's a five-man slot, tight end gap seal. So he's sealing for the C gap, coming back out for the D gap. Uh, hand placement. What does the hand placement for your offensive line look as they're I – mean, you obviously says it's uh, square shuffled, but what, what does their hand placement look like during that? Um, we were a big hook team. Okay. So the um, double under style thing. But if we're in that, we're more of a uh, – we're carrying our hands just like we would in pass pro. Okay. Because if we're, – because we're not penetrating up the field, this kind of doesn't help us out as much. Mm-hmm. You're penetrating up the field, the hook is really good because you're redirecting the force up, you know. But um, if you're sliding, then it kind of def- – this kind of defeats the whole purpose of doing it. Okay. Um, Spread out protection. Da, da, da. Spread out protection, um, basically all the sides I have, the purpose of spread out blocking scheme, drills. Drills are huge when solidifying this um, gap seal. So the reason we do it, like I said, get the pocket moving, allow the QB to use athleticism. We're going to take the pro, the nice way of talking about quarterbacks here. Um, this guy's has an outside run. The need to read, we want to abuse that with the defense. If they need to read, give them a chapter book, baby. Like, make them read Harry Potter, not Cat in the Hat. <laughs> um, you know how def- As an offensive guy, I played O-line um, for some great offensive line coaches. So we're always smarter than the defense. Sorry, Coach. Um, so we need to make them read chapter books so they get confused. And I know our D-line coach is going to watch this shit shake his head at me, but it's okay. And spread the defense out with a cross-formation around. So here's where our um, spread out protection really looks like. As you see, it's very easy install for our guys. Yeah. Outside zone steps. For the first, for basically the front side of the offensive line, and then the gap seal for the back side. And and then you yeah. kind of mentioned that that back there is kind of, I don't know, is more of your adjuster essentially. He can go where you need to go. Okay. Yeah. So here we've got center, guard, tackle, tight end is in the blocking scheme. Yeah. So we don't need him in the front. He might as well help out the tackle on the back end. Okay. Or go off a route. I mean, it depends whatever our OC is a skinny dude, so he draws up all these things. <laughs> and I just get the, hey, how do we block this? And I either say, like this, or it's going to be very difficult. And he goes, okay. Yeah, there you go. We have a very good working relationship, Coach Smith and I. Good. Um, drill work. I'm a very simple drill work guy. Um, it doesn't need to be fancy. Um, just gotta feel what you do. Yeah, I mean, the simple the drill, the better. I see guys reinventing the wheel with drill work and adding in all this other stuff, and um, it doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't make me very excited. Uh, so we just shuffle, and shuffling that drive catch shuffle. It seems easy when you're reading Charles Bentley's book and watching his video. It is not easy to teach. It is not easy to teach. The more time I spend teaching these guys how to ski back and forth and in the weight room over cones and stuff, it's huge. Um, one thing I did learn this offseason clinicking is a lot of offensive line guys will say, oh, you got to get your pads lower. Um, I think that's kind of a outdated way of coaching it. Um, low hips, low hips. Because how are you going to get your pads lower? You don't want yeah. them punched over, right? Yeah. Look at their hips. Hips are, your, hips, hips are your focal point. Drop your hips. Avoid lower your pads because then you get a leaner. And that's like a defensive lineman's dream is a leaner. If you sink those hips and you're stout in there, it's a coaching point that's more versatile and easier for somebody to correct than lower your pad level. You're, you're the second O-line coach I've talked to the past couple weeks that's kind of mentioned that. When I, t- I mean, me and you talked before you came on about um, – OU's O line coach, uh, but he mentioned a lot of things about ankles and hip hip depth uh, when he was talking his half man half slide stuff as well. Yeah, it's all about the hips, all in the hips. Um, you just validated my point that I came up in the office when I was making this presentation. So, um, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. 
Um, base integrity is huge. You can't have their feet get too close together. I mean, that's just standard football. Um, and active eyes, you need to be looking everywhere. If one guy leaves, one thing I do with my offensive line, and I've made a preference or I set a precedence of it this year, was I'm teaching them how defensive players roll. So my offensive line then now knows how to read a defensive backfield. It was the best thing I've ever done because now they know at a higher level that if one guy leaves, somebody's going to replace him. Okay. And it's really not that hard to teach. Hey, that safety is going to come down and replace this guy. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be scientific. It's, they just need to know who's replacing what. And if you're scheming and you know that if uh, if you're seeing a two two safety look and one of their safeties is always down further if he's going to replace then they look and they're like oh the depths of the safeties are off i wonder where the pressure's coming from there so drill film this is our fine young men this uh past fall in our uh, COVID practices um we're just working on the shuffle boom keeping that integrity keeping our eyes and getting a couple shuffles and jogging it through um, we use QB step overs. Um, the boards are great, but they're paying the move. And you can QB step overs, you can put two or three together to get what you need. Um, so they're staying nice and tight with their upper body, hands active, um, keeping their feet integrity or their distance integrity in the bottom in the bottom half of their body. 77 does a really nice job here. Um, he's got quick feet, boom, shuffles. It's like cutting butter. Does a great job. Um, boom, boom. And we just want them all in unison. I think that's a true test if um, your guys are working together. And this is actually a good clip. And the reason I included it, look at 64. He gets his feet too close together. And that's going to cause a problem when we start adding pressure. Because look at his feet here. Both of them. Yeah. That's not a drive catch. That's a step and drag. Yeah. And when you get your feet too close together, then you become I'm a I'm a Jewish guy like a dreidel. Top, if you prefer. You get toppled or uh, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> I got a room full of uh, a bunch of comedians. Um and then this is what you asked, like the gap seal. Stay square yeah. on the B gap seal. You got to keep your hands active. I mean, I, lo I love um, Coach Strollo, and he's been a really great mentor to me, but I hate the term more than people. So I just say active hands. Got to keep those hands active because once they stop, as soon as they stop, just because of some physics, new human law or whatever, something bad's going to happen. Yeah. Low hips again. Base integrity, base integrity, base integrity. I almost strapped four or uh, their legs to PVC pipes. I got so frustrated with gap integrity um, that we actually do it in our position aspect of our weight program. Active eyes, you want to be looking all over. It protects the inside first. Um, quickest way to the quarterback. Um, Quarterback, as much as um, they're prima donnas and they wear pink towels and stuff, they're still ours. They're our prima donnas. So we got to keep them upright. So here we have an example of a gap seal. Boom, boom. Nobody comes. And his eyes are actively scanning back. His eyes are actively scanning that backside for backside C gap pressure. My boy, this guy's going to, I'm 27. He's going to make me gray, but he's a heck of a football player. Boom, boom. And he goes the wrong way. And there's my wonderfully overly athletic self demonstrating boom and coming back around. So gap seal, it's very important for us. We'll go back to uh 64's clip. Good job taking care of the inside and then slowly bleeding back outside. Yeah. Here we've got, let's see. 
here we're in. Uh, we're playing a team right up the road. Um, it's burnout protection. As you can see, we got some feet crossing here. Now we're looking for the center is doing a nice job. We got a nice job going here, but the common the common point here is we're all moving this way. Yeah, we're attempting to keep our shoulders square. This is five freshmen. It's not going to be perfect. Yeah, I mean we're a young program, but the concept of the play is forcing that defense feeding their need to read and looks what, look what happens when you force a defense's or when you feed the defense's need to read mm -hmm. well, you got 52 panic and he's their force player and you kind of bought more yep. time i mean he, I, I teach that exact technique if you can't get to find a flat or a dump off pass and, and move on but i mean he should have got there a lot faster but he had to think yeah i think the Feeding the need to read. Because then when our quarterback gets out, when he gets here, force player, this guy's like, ah, oh, shoot. Something's yeah. happening that I can't stop. I'll t and he's got a lead blocker. Would you, would you want uh, – I had two questions on this. One, obviously, I'm assuming your left guard there should have been a little more flatter and step up field as much on that. And then two, your backside hinge. Um, obviously, you said these are all freshmen. You're a very young pro. You got what one or two seasons, full seasons in at this point, or um, so. I, I'm gonna guess his footwork probably should have been more towards what we saw in the clip before than kind of just staying there and trying to catch. Yep. So he should be here because he's got a guy. Well, he needs to step that way anyway. Yeah. But. He's got a guy crossing his face to the B gap. He gets stuck in molasses. And I mean, yes, the defensive guy doesn't get there, but if he was more athletic, yeah, he's chasing, he's chasing the quarterback down. And one thing I don't like that we did here is they, we see a twist and it stops our feet. Just let them go. If they're going to run away backside, just let them go. Yeah. Who cares? Just let them, just let them be defensive guys back there. <laughs> this is one of our uh, first varsity games in Keystone College history, um, where we've got our. We schemed that because the guy was so wide, because the DM was so wide, we we're almost gonna we we're gonna pin him down with our yeah. extra lineman here. Um, so we pinned him down. The offensive line, look at that. It almost becomes a fold technique at that point. Yeah, I mean that's our grilled cheese concept, um, our GC. I mean it's not really our center, but yeah. But again, uh, we're just eliminating that D end because he's so wide. Okay. And we're just gonna move around them. Um, because they're playing that wide nine, like that old Eagles wide nine. Yeah. Um, uh, but feed their need to read. Where's everybody? Yep. Now, the rest of this play gives me heartburn. But. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. But let's stop <laughs> it right here before um, I get acid reflux. Feeding the need to read held up their entire defense. If he he has the ability here, number fourteen, to just tuck it and go, touchdown. Yeah, I mean I don't I can't see the I don't, I don't see the uh, wide zone of it, but I can only imagine there's not a soul open, and it's probably a good five ten yards right here. If he just goes for it now, because again we're feeding their need to read. Oh, nah. Right? It took yep. nine of their defenders out just by keeping our shoulders square and running outside zone. So. Yeah. Because they don't know what's going on. It could be inside zone. It could be mid zone. It could be outside zone. But no, it's sprint out. You're keeping everybody condensed and running around the riffraff. Well, it made some greedy, too. Yeah. 
I mean, it was easy to, you know, they're going to go underneath, make it look like they have a shot. Mm-hmm. Now, do you, um, uh, obviously this is a, it's a more condensed formation. Do you ever go like Trey with number two and three split out wide? How do you go with nub support? I mean, if you, if you got a, a guy outside the shoulder of the tight end, that's kind of a tough guy to block. Yep. Uh, I understand this is more condensed than nub. Would you just send that guy to chip? The outside defender? Yep. Okay. And he's going to follow his outside run rules in his count. So basically, this, they're running, if they're not involved in the pass, they're running their outside run rules. So okay. they actually have full variations within their outside run rules, and that's probably what we would run. Okay. Especially if we know, like we mentioned before, if we know they're going to send a corner blitz, just based on formation, alignment, FOB, whatever we'll crack that guy or we'll we'll guide him in and take him right out of the equation well that's a good part about and i've, I've kind of trended it that way myself of having so many set rules and to where like if if there's a rule that's going to suit us better versus a kid or a specific scheme you can just this is what we're going to do this week you don't have to reteach an entire philosophy mm-hmm. that this is what we're going to do in, in- <laughs> And it's easy to change. It's easy to change one guy's assignment mm-hmm. and add it as a wrinkle, saying, "Hey, this week instead of doing this, you're going to do this," just like we did with the tight end with the wide nine. Just take him down. Now, how do you handle any? How do you handle field pressures? Um, any anyone that kind of sends an the apex player. Well, I, I, I guess you can send a corner to the, to the field, but that's pretty hard. Is that? Is there an adjustment, a quarterback throw a hot route, kind of know where his hot route is, or just kind of chalk it up, get what you can, and move on to the next play? It really depends on the like the pass we have. I mean, he's going to have a hot route. I mean, we've actually had it not in a game situation, but in a practice situation where um, our, we have a really savvy running back that will, if he sees – Pressure like that, he can help flip the steps. Nice, though. Wow. Um, that turned into something that we schemed later in the season. But um, we usually try to get the quarterback and out. But in this formation, we have basically three tight ends in. So if we were in a real formation set, maybe like a three by one or a true two by two, he would have an out for pressure. Okay. Do you do any uh, leak stuff off your rollouts? Would you leak a tight end to the opposite side with the throwback stuff, or are you guys usually pretty set in stone thrown to the roll sprint outside? Um, year one we were pretty set in stone throwing to the roll outside just because we had all freshmen. Sure. I mean, we really limited what we taught the guys. Like we wanted to be good at certain things. Mm-hmm. But once you start adding that backside out, the rat was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but when you give them too many options when they're young, sure, they're going to try to go for like the fancy option. We'll, we'll look at power, and I'll use power as an example of that. So you know, you we have a backside thing or backside gap really in power. Like you have the where you're replacing. Where the guard pulls, you have that gap. And you see in the NFL all the time where guys, running backs will take that and they'll get like five or six yards. Mm-hmm. I hate that because it teaches our guys that that's there. And we don't want them to take it right away. We don't want to take it anyway. But it might be viable if everything's all wadded up. Maybe that bend back. But we don't even touch, we didn't even touch that near one. Um, just because we wanted to limit their focus to their assignment because our year one philosophy was we want our base stuff installed we want to be good at what we're going to be good at for years to come and as they get older we can add wrinkles in so sure. we're going 2021 what you just asked is that backside leak like we could put the tight end on the backside and just leak him out just as a safety where he where the quarterback could just plant front side it's kind of a long throw but kind of gives them an out what, what kind of coverages do you guys get, get the most? Um, uh, what, what do you struggle with the most at that, too? Probably. 
like a tight man. Okay. Yeah. Man. How's that? that now, do you struggle with that just because mostly you're just so young and the rest of the league has like a lot older kids at this point compared to you? Because I think once they get older and stronger, yeah, you have the guys that are going to be able to create that separation. But you experience too. You've seen it at this point. You've been in football, competitive football for eight years. Some of those cats. So like you've seen an out route release. You've seen a a comeback. You've seen it all. So you're a lot more comfortable playing man than mm-hmm. even. It, it, I mean, it's just different. I mean, just, I mean, you're talking about a borderline kid versus a grown man at 22 years old. Yeah. You know, I mean, so, uh, so part part of it, I, I like running defending sprint outs. This is where I've ran into issues. I've killed teams in coverages with crowd, and then the quarterback takes off for eight yards. Oh, and then I I try to do some field pressure stuff. And somehow it doesn't work. So I've, I've really struggled with, uh, but I've never, I never, I thought about doing a little bit more match quarters to trips mm-hmm. or to the field. Um, I, but the problem is, man, is when you do match quarters or even cloud, you never have anyone really for the quarterback. Yeah, because you, man, I always have someone on the quarterback. You know, cause just to, I mean, you can't just be playing man and disregard a quarterback and watch him take off for 20 yards because everyone's back to the ball. So that's something I never really thought about is getting in man more. I mean, there's the two different philosophies, I think, and I, I'm an offensive-oriented guy. But it depends, and I think it really depends on what kind of quarterback you're playing against. We had a very, we have very athletic quarterbacks that can run. Like, they're runners. They have that ability. So we're running Q power, Q counter, um, all that kind of stuff. So if you create a cloudy vision in the pass, they have the ability to run. Mm -hmm. That's where it really comes down to. If you basically create a more defined look in the pass in a man set, but you have a man on the quarterback, with a quarterback that relies on that athleticism, if he's got a man on him, he, I think he has a greater chance of making a mistake because he doesn't sure. have the safety net to roll on. If you get a Tom Brady, let me rephrase that. If you get a kid with Tom Brady's athleticism, he's not the most athletic dude in the world. Sure. I mean, that's but what... Run more on more of a cloud coverage and make everything gray and force a kid to make a decision because you know even if he runs, he's not going to go far. Makes sense, Yeah. Well, it's just kind of like, and that's kind of, well, in high school too, man, usually the best half is play quarterback. Mm-hmm. You know, how they just teach them how to throw. But part of the reason why they roll them out, get them out in space, it's an easier throw than sitting in the pocket, scanning the field and throwing it. I mean, well, I mean, you got quarterbacks that hardly can throw a bubble in the pocket, you know, or yeah. effectively. I mean, balls at the ankles, balls over the head or it's, or it looks like a duck and they are getting there. I mean, I can be play side safety run down the alley and make it for a three yard game. As so as that is. So I, I like it. I like how you do a lot of rollouts and condensed formations too. And I think a lot of that was because of the age of our kids. I mean, having those guys, because as we progress, this was earlier in the season, as we progressed to the season, we didn't need all that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm big on condensed too, because it, if you run a condensed formation, in theory, especially with outside zone, you're making that corner come up and make a tackle. Mm-hmm. You spread it out, that corner, the worst tacklers, in theory, or out wide, not having to get involved in a run game. So I, I love, plus it just gives you a little bit, if you condense the field and run sp- sp- spread outs and stuff like that, make it harder on the DB to pick that stuff up. Uh. You got to put, and I mean, this is typical offense philosophy. You got to use what you have to put the defense in binds. I mean, and that's where the keeping your shoulders square came in. It's use their assignments against them. Yeah. Well, I like it too, because it's, especially if the guy's head up, it might be a little bit of an issue if he's on the outside shoulder, but if he's head up or in an eye te- technique, like, even if he beats you around, just with the shuffle technique, engaging in him will make sure he'll never get to the quarterback. And he'll get desperate and he'll always, 100% of the time, undercut it. He'll never fight over top. 
Because, mm-hmm. I mean, like you said, you always probably teach it once you've got a hinge. You said build the wall. You know what I mean? Open the hips up and let them run that way. So that, that's, I mean, that's what I did. I mean, anytime I taught that, if they go underneath, you want, you want to rep, move on. They lost or never make the play. Yeah. They got to go underneath of you. And then part of coaching offensive line is breaking the wall of the defensive line. Yeah. Like, yeah. once you beat them mentally, you win. It's easy. And the worst, and you could have stud, and this is Coach Higgins and I talk about this all the time, you could have stud defensive linemen physically. But mental midgets, I hated playing against those smaller defensive linemen that weren't as talented that never gave up. Amen. Like, if you have some dog in you, it's a long night. Ooh. And you could tell that they lifted weights. Like, oh my gosh. Well, it's just, I, I knew if I if I went up against someone that was around my size, I knew they would be equally as lazy in times. Like if I win the first three steps, I win the rep. When you got a little guy, you're like, oh no. All game long, I just gotta I gotta bring it six steps to con- get to play, man. I hated it. Hated it. Those little guys never give up. And I'm like, dude, just give up. <laughs> I'm fat. You're not. Like, I need oxygen. Stop. But we'd always get a bus kicked in high school. So, like, 46 nothing. But look, dude, you've had your fun. Just yeah. quit. Just go out of here, man. So. Oh, there you go. Here's a good example. Um, because they're wide nine, if you watch our left tackle here, um, boom, boom, he knows that he's not coming in the B gap. Yeah. So he just, he takes that courtesy step and he's back out. Now, would you argue that he probably should take a little bit more just in case the, the mic there? Because, I mean... I mean, there, there's a little bit of a hole there at that point, so. He should, definitely, and twice as much, and I think he didn't uh, He didn't get the, he didn't look. So if he was if he was thinking, if you looked here and did not see a tight end on the front side, yeah, he knows that he's not getting tailback help. So you're right, he does need to. And I'll give him, I think I gave him a plus, plus, minus for this because of that reason, because I agree on a three-point scale for each play. Um, because he didn't, but I gave him a plus two out of three basically because he's so wide. Yeah. Like, he's a whole person outside of him. So he still could have taken a shuffle step in and come back out and blocked him. So I see both sides. Yeah. But he should have. And if you look here, our center kind of gets bogged down. He's a little late to the party. Yeah. He's a little late to the party. That fat finger that just exited out. Um, off the snap, he's already not taking the footwork we need him no. to. He's too worried about the backside guy to. Yeah. Let 58, let our backside attack or guard take care of him. Yeah. B gap sound. Because God forbid that uh, linebacker gets froggy. Yeah. Because if he gets froggy. You're some serious run through problems. This is your fear. Yeah. Like this means he is hurting. Yeah. He's getting smoked. And you don't have Pat, Pat Mahomes there who can just throw. Um, as he's falling to the ground. I've never seen anything like that like I did the other night. I had a quarterback coach from last year in the room with me, and I'm just like, I, I've never seen a human being do that. I was, thinking, I was like, the closest thing I've ever seen was maybe Brett Favre, but even that wasn't, like, slinging like that. I mean, you're... It, yeah. yeah. Just, like, little flicks of the wrist. Just, oh, here, here. Like, and they're, they're like, pin, almost pinpoint accurate half the time. It's just like, yeah. Like that last one where he was like falling to the ground as just zooming it. Like, that's just unfair. 
he did not have one ounce of quit in him until the end of the game. No. And I respect and I love Tom Brady because he's a great winner. But after that game, I had 10 times respect for Patrick Mahomes just because throughout that entire game getting smoked and that Bucks defense was great and he was down two tackles and their their backup tackles were struggling. He's getting hit. Oh, not one hair of give up in that guy. Give me like a piece of his heart like hair and just take the heart out of it and you could redo football. Great. Yeah, he had 73. They're worried too much about the backside there. Just keep going. Just yeah. keep going. Uh, I yelled at him for this. And like 71, he's too concerned with like trying to grab him. Just keep going. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Go, go, go. But then, our, and then that's a perfect example of why we had that tailback there. Because 81, he's running a route the incorrect way. And our tailback there is like, okay, I can get a piece of this. And gives our quarterback a little more breathing room. Yeah. He does a great job. Our center does a better job. He's got a guy head up on him, so it's a little bit easier. But if our tackle just stays, see how high his hips are? Yeah. He's got help. He's got good help back side too. His guards on his hip, so yeah. Even if he overruns him, you've still got the guard there. But again, I mean, I'll take this look because we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of eleven guys occupied by five. Yeah. Half the time, it's two, it's two people are blocking themselves just by thinking it's a run play. But deal. Take that any of the week. We had a big blocking yourself discussion in the office today. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's all I got for film. Well, well coaches, um, co- coaches uh, contact info is one on the screen if you're watching. Uh, but if you're listening, um, it, it will be in the bio as well. Both his email and his Twitter, uh, which are on my screen. Um, and again, if you if you need help spelling his last name, it's Goog, Lai, Elmo. It's kind of the easy way of doing it. Just remember that El- Elmo is in his last name. You can call him Coach Elmo. Just send him just send him random DMs of, that says Coach Elmo for me. That would be uh, anybody that makes it to this point. Or or actually, what would be better is if people would do this, and this will tell me really how many people got to the end of this. It's just. Send him gifts of Elmo on Twitter. And just flood his, please. That would that nothing would make me happier. I would. Oh, it'd be beautiful. Um, but coach, I thank you for coming on. I thank you for talking sprout protection. Um, coach is a good dude. Uh, like I said, all his other videos will be in the bio as well. Um, but at this point, I got. I'm gonna wrap this up, and then me and coach are gonna talk for a little bit. So uh, that was another episode of the Gap Down Backer Podcast.